episode 85, Seven Questions for Atheists by Dr. Michael Brown. This is Matthew, and in this episode of Still Unbelievable, Andrew and I are joined by friends who are repeat guests to answer questions for atheists by Dr. Michael Brown. To see his list of questions, see link one in the show notes. As part of our response to the first question, Andrew gives a couple of resources for those struggling with religious issues. These can be found in links two and three. Link three covers most countries in the world, not just the USA. Links four and five are UK-based sources that I was able to find. Also during the discussion, Andrew references a discussion we had with Brian Blaze on miracles. This is episode 84. And finally, David mentions his Red Letters blog and book. See link six. Enjoy the show. Hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of Still Unbelievable. This time we're tackling another set of questions. And it's seven questions this time. We've not done seven questions before. But we haven't got seven guests, but we have got three guests. So I'm going to take a step back on this episode. I'm just going to be the voice doing the questions. You've heard enough of my voice lately. So we're going to give Andrew a chance to say his bit. I know you love it when Andrew talks. And we're having regular returning guest, Darren. Good to hear you again, Darren. How are you? Doing pretty good. Excellent. Friend of the show who we don't have on often enough, David. How are you, David? I'm well, thank you. Excellent. Lovely to have you back on. And someone who hasn't been on for a very, very long time, but who I've got to know over the last couple of years and is more often talking with David on his side. Sarah, how are you, ma'am? I'm good. I'm good. Excellent. Good to be back. It is. Glad to have you on. So we're tackling seven questions from, do I call him an apologist? Uh, Dr. Michael Brown, I think his name is. He puts some questions up on Twitter I did a brief response uh, to those questions, giving one word answers. And then I said to Andrew, hey, Andrew, I found another set of questions. And he said, good, let's go for it. So this is the, the, the this is that it. We're going for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go jump straight into the questions, give my guests a chance to answer them. Before I get into that, the very first thing that I'm going to note, because it feeds back straight into something that I said last time Andrew and I addressed questions, and that is the title of these questions are Seven Honest Questions for Atheists. And I said then, I always get suspicious when the questions have to be prefixed with the word honest. If you really have to say that the questions are honest, then I doubt that they are honest. I automatically assume that there is an agenda. And I'm disappointed again here because that is exactly what I feel. But we're going to go through these questions anyway. We're going to talk around them, or rather my guests are going to talk around them, and we're going to see where we land up. You know, he's almost up to William Lane Craig's status apologist. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Was that a non-compliment you just gave there, David? I despise Dr. Michael Brown, and I, I've, I've tried to do better. I've had him early on, on Skeptics and Seekers. I didn't like him then. And then he switched and became a Trump supporter. And I liked him even less. And he has said a lot of incendiary things since. And so he wanted to kind of go on a show and set the record straight and Dale uh, do him and they brought him on the show. And I just, I tried to get along. I tried to have an open mind as one of the few interviews where I just could not have an open mind and it showed and uh, we hated each other pretty much from the start and it was just kind of knives out from there. So uh, I, I just know who he is and I know what he's about and it is almost impossible for me to be objective when looking at questions or statements from Dr. Michael Brown. That said, I'm going to do my best to have some philosophical charity, uh, maybe steel man some of the questions a little bit you know, deal with the questions themselves and not the person who's asking them. Right. OK, that is a very fair and honest point. And you've just reminded me there is an apologist, uh, Cameron, I think his name is. He goes under the moniker of capturing Christianity, who has a phrase which I think works here. Questions are not arguments. So if Michael Brown is trying to use his questions here to drive to a conclusion, maybe we ought to flag up there that's questions, not arguments. Build your arguments on a case, not on questions which are designed to lead, because then you're manipulating. 
So with all of that said, let's dive in onto the first question and see how long it takes us. So question one, would you say that you are or were an atheist based primarily on intellectual study or based on experience? Or did you never believe in God at all? Darren, shall we start with you? Because I think I know what your answer is on that one. I guess yes to all of them. Never really believed in God at all. These days it's based primarily on intellectual study and personal experience. Believers have never really provided any evidence or reason to believe that God exists. So, well, not good ones anyways. So I guess that's my answer to that. Okay, nice and short. Uh, Andrew, do you want to pick that one up? As our listeners, or regular listeners know, I was a Christian at some point in the past. I haven't been for a long time. I was part of the conservative Church of Christ. And so the the question hits me largely the same way it does Darren, because we didn't believe in modern miracles anyway. So I would have said, as a member of the Church of Christ, the way I hear this question, I didn't have any supernatural experiences that led me to be a Christian. And then I only had those experiences that I thought of as normal within the natural world kind of experiences, right? So the things that I thought were uh, good reasons to be a Christian vanished under the light of further examination. I didn't have experiential reasons to be a Christian then. I don't have experiential reasons to be a Christian now. Intellectually, I think that my lack of belief is founded on quite good reasons not to believe. So that's where I am. Okay, thank you. David? Uh, mostly what he said. Uh, in the Churches of Christ, there's no expectation of flashy miracles or things like that. And so it's hard to say that, uh, you know, you stopped believing because the miracles didn't happen. We didn't expect them to happen anyway. But everything that might have been testable, that didn't happen either. So a piece that passes understanding, you know, for instance, I didn't have any of that assurance of God's grace and uh, future salvation. Well, I didn't have any of that. Freedom from fear. I didn't have any of that. Moving toward holiness and, you know, moving away from your sinful urges and predilections. I didn't have any of that. And so at some point, all of theology became explanations of why the promises of the New Testament don't happen. And I think that's still largely the project of theology today at the level of the church. It's preachers explaining why you're not getting the blessings that God has set out for you. And at some point, the explanations just became more and more hollow until there just wasn't anything left to defend. And so I suppose you could, you know, it's easy to say, well, I, you know, I'm so intellectual. My, I intellectually <laughs> thought my way out of Christianity. I think it is probably experientially, everything that I was led to believe that Christianity was supposed to be just didn't materialize, and the excuses for why became more hollow and more transparent. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to join in? Yeah, so I was factory set as a Christian, so three, three generations of Christian grandparents and parents, and we were on the, on the third one there. So um, it was just the way life was. That's the way life made sense. I mean, I, you know, not just nominally Christian, but generally born again. And we did expect the miracles. We did expect all those things to happen. Uh, you do question it a little bit when you're younger, but not, not so much. It was just... Just the way it was. I did have some experiences that I put down to God. I uh, counted too many hits and coincidences as being him. So it kept kept you there for a while. But uh, eventually, it's as everyone says, the it doesn't quite live up to what you think it should do. Um, the guidance you're supposed to get, the comfort, and as David said, the anxiety, holiness, and peace, and all that kind of thing. They're not really there. They don't seem to be. Uh, essentially, I started um, worrying how it would help in the event of a real life crisis if something really went badly wrong in life whether it would stand you in good stead and whether you know god would come through for you in some way i didn't necessarily expect him to solve everything but yeah i started questioning that what good it was what difference it made uh, how it helps you in, in the difficult things um, and i didn't really find the answers and then when certain difficult things did happen i really found it let me down big time and so then i went on a quest to find out and it was after that that i'd say it's more the intellectual side of it um yeah 
fact finding and digging in a bit more that uh, persuaded me that it doesn't look like it might be all that it's cracked up to be. Thank you. So all of you have affirmed an intellectual reason for either leaving Christianity or not even taking it seriously in the first place. But what I have seen and accusations thrown at people who leave, and it's certainly a question that I myself have had quite a few times, is what bad experience did you have that caused you to leave? But none of you guys have affirmed a positive answer to that question. You've all avoided saying that there was a bad experience that caused you to leave. And the avoided is probably the wrong word because it could give the wrong impression. You've not given that answer, presumably because it's not true. So does anyone want to speak to this idea that some Christians have that those of us who leave only leave because of a bad or a rotten experience? Yeah, I'll start. So I didn't have a bad experience uh, in church as a as a child. I didn't have someone, um, uh, you know, I didn't have someone assaulting me in, in dark corners or, or anything like that. My church experience was broadly tolerable, as tolerable as I find uh, church can be. I, you know, I don't actually enjoy the, the ceremony of, of church. Uh, so I didn't have any, I didn't have any bad uh, experiences in, in church that, that caused me to, uh, to walk away. And hand in hand with that, I did not walk away because I had some sin I needed to pursue. I didn't leave because someone did something vile to me. And I didn't leave because I wanted to do something vile to someone else. Um, so we can just we can just get rid of both of those ideas. And by vile to someone else, I just mean I'm not pursuing some secret sin that the church would be overly concerned about. So neither of those were true for me. I think certain people may indeed leave faith or church or, or whatever because of a bad experience. That's perfectly uh Perfectly reasonable thing to do, I suppose. I think they just want to box you in with that question, really. Just say, ha ha, see, you just, it's man that has let you down, not God, really. If we can pin it on something, uh, just human nature or something, we can maybe get around and reconvince you to come back. But I'd had enough experiences in church where churches let you down, Christians let you down, to know that that was something different to what God would be. So, no, I don't think it's a, a bad experience in, in and of itself would have put me off, but... At the same time, I understand it can, it could do that to certain people, and it's a perfectly legitimate reason to to move to to move away. If you've been badly wounded by a church, then it's a good it's a good reason to leave. I think that's a really good point, Sarah. If people are in a structure or a scenario which is causing them distress, then the only right thing to do for their own well being is yeah. to leave. Or if that you've had if you've just structure. had it mediated to you in such a way that it's just a sick and twisted thing in your mind of, you know, lots of guilt and, and confessing and all that kind of thing, a kind of you know, heavy Catholic guilt that you might have that we often uh, say that that's what the Catholics have compared to the Protestants, but I think it's pretty much the same on both sides. And if that's enough to mess with you, then yeah, you should leave. I did have some bad experiences, but I, I never cite bad experiences as a part of why I left the church. I don't, I, it's just, I've always had bad experiences. So that's just what it is. But I concur with Sarah. If you have had experiences bad enough to make you need to flee that environment, uh, that is a legitimate reason. And Christians usually ask that question so that they can delegitimize your answer. Yes. It does not delegitimize the answer because they have had experience under the authority of a church which is under the watch of God, and God didn't protect you from that. And and whether he says he would or not is almost irrelevant. There's no protection for you or your family, your kids. And so you were victimized by somebody or some situation uh, related to the church, and you got yourself out of it, and you lived a better life. Great. That's God's issue to deal with that's not yours. I would say one other thing about bad experiences in general, the idea that, oh, well, it's the people, it's not God. Well, the, the church is the people. It is the assembly. You know, it is the family, uh, as it were. And if you do not find that you are experiencing that family, you are 
kind of an outcast. You can't fit into the click. You know, that may not be someone mistreating you per se, but that's one of those kind of implied promises that's just not happening. And maybe you have more of a family experience by going to, you know, joining a bowling league. So you leave church and you join the bowling league. Great. That's also a legitimate reason because this thing that was supposed to be a, a safe family-like experience for you who never had a safe place and maybe you had a bad family that didn't materialize that way, that's legit. And no one should feel bad about that reason. Matthew, before you move on as a public service announcement to the listeners, if you're one of our listeners who does have bad church experiences, if this kind of talk bothers you, if you feel triggered by this kind of thing and you need help with your religious experiences, help is out there. And I'm going to give you a couple of resources right now. On the web, if you go to www.recoveringfromreligion.org, recoveringfromreligion.org, there are two resources there. There's the Hotline Project. Uh, The Hotline Project is manned mostly 24 hours a day now. And you can call the hotline number and talk to someone who has been trained to help you. You can do that right now. Go to recoveringfromreligion.org. Check the hotline project, find the number, give them a call. And you can call as often as you want and as long as you want. You won't always get the same person, obviously. But that's not the only help because the agents on the hotline project are not professional therapists. They are there to help, but they're not professional therapists, even though they have some training in helping people who are having traumatic experiences in religion. But the secular therapy project at recoveringfromreligion.org, will connect you with a professional therapist near you or, or even as telehealth. You can find a professional counselor that will help you address your life without any religious dogma, without the stigma of, of any particular religion. These are people who will help you where you are and not bring church back into your life. If you need that help, recoveringfromreligion.org. That's here in the United States. Matthew, you may know of resources in the UK and the EU, but I don't know those off the top of my head. Recoveringfromreligion.org will be in the show notes. And Matthew, whatever else you want to include. I don't know any off the top of my head, but check the show notes. There'll be something in the show notes when you're listening to this. Okay, thanks for that break and apologies. I could I recuse myself of the second question, so that'll make things go along quicker. And for the third question, I have a one word answer. So when we get there, you'll get one word. OK, so we'll trot along then. So question two, would you say that even as an atheist, you still have a sense of purpose and destiny in your life? A feeling that you were put here for a reason and that you have a mission to accomplish Or is it primarily people of faith who feel like this, since we are simply the products of an unguided random evolutionary process? The question is sort of an interesting one, because as the question is written, I would have to say I don't experience the type of purpose that he's suggesting, because all of this assumes that purposes can only be achieved if someone has put you here or designed you for that purpose. But I would say that I still have a purpose for life. It's just one that I've chosen myself. And I would say that he's right. That is only primarily people of faith who feel that they were put here for this purpose, but not because of any sort of unguided random evolutionary process, but more along the lines of the hyperactive agency detection that that unguided evolutionary process has instilled in humans. So my answer to that is no but only because as far as I can tell, there's no one here to provide us a purpose except ourselves. So if you're talking about self-purpose, then yeah, I have lots of that, lots of uh, missions to accomplish. They're just missions that I've chosen for myself, not some... That was the thing with the word put here for a reason. It implies a putter, (laughs) somebody who's put you there. So I don't like the way the question's been uh, worded in that sense, because it's almost trying to sneak that in. So you have a sense of purpose. Yes, you can have a perfectly good sense of purpose. We've got enough things from, you know, wise people throughout the ages to know what constitutes a good life, a well-lived life, if that's 
one way of putting it. I think there's plenty out there to know that it's, you know, if you sit and watch TV all day long for the rest of your life, it's probably not the most useful uh, uh, use of your time and that you could be better, better used doing lots of other things. We know that helping others brings about deep sense of fulfillment and things like that. So I think we've got the tools to, to have a purpose-driven life and to make certain things your goals. Uh, but I don't, that doesn't mean we were put here by a putter to do that and with a mission. And I think the other thing is with Christians is half the time I was sat there scratching my head to work out what this special God mission was that I was supposed to work out to, to do with my life. You know, ultimately it has to be the, the missionary kind of mission where you should be serving God at pretty much 100% of your time. And that's pretty much the only thing that counts as, as a well-lived life. But when you don't necessarily feel a calling to some far-flung place, you, you're often left thinking, well, I'm just going to be a regular receptionist or teacher or policeman or whatever. You know, it's it can give you a lot of angst in that respect as well. So I don't know what he's on about. There's no putter. You're here. Life's a gift. Make the most of it, really. Thank you. Andrew. Okay. So I want to tackle this from two directions. First, unguided random. That's part of this question. There's an unguided random evolutionary process. Uh, that's a, that is a deliberate is a deliberate misstating uh, of what the theory of evolution teaches. And this is one of the most common straw men that I see when this question comes up. And this question has been asked almost exactly this way, and we've covered it in other shows. Now. Unguided random evolution. Well, um, if, if evolution were truly random, we'd never talk about evolutionary forces, right? We'd, we'd never talk about natural selection. Uh, we wouldn't talk about allele frequency over time. We're not talking about randomness in the way that he uses that word. We're not talking about a completely random process. So it's just dishonesty all the way down at that level of the question. But the thing that really bothers me is I, I think what Daniel and Sarah both touched on, which is this feeling of purpose. So do I feel like I have a purpose? Probably not in the sense that this question means, but why is feeling of purpose a good gauge of whether I have a purpose or not? So let's say that I felt like I had a God-given purpose to be a white nationalist and to stamp out all occurrences of any race in the United States that, that wasn't white. And let's say I really felt like that was my God-given purpose. Would that be a good purpose? Would it be good feeling? Would I be right in some sense to follow it? This question is poisoned, and I hope that our listeners hear it as the poison that it is and disregard it for exactly what it is because it deserves to be disregarded. Yes, you are perfectly entitled to do it, David, and walk by this question. It's perfectly acceptable response. Yep, I, I'm I'm standing firm. <laughs> this is exactly the kind of question I meant when I said I go all twitchy whenever I see a heading that says these are my honest questions for you. This is what I expect, and I got it at number two. There's probably another one. Let's move on and find out, shall we? <laughs> number three, would you say that you are one hundred percent sure? that there is no such being as God. By no. God, I mean an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing being. Or would you say that for all... We'll stop right there. Let's just go with as it, as it is. Are you 100% sure there is no such being <laughs> as God? Sarah, no. do you want to try it? Okay. <laughs> all right, David, that was several words. 100% They might have been the sure, same, but no, it was several words. <laughs> How, I don't know, epistemologically speaking. Um, <laughs> there may be a, a God. I think it's probably unlikely, but, you know, who knows? I don't see any evidence for certainly a God being that's all-powerful or, or, you know, otherwise why more could be done, um, better things could be done, and they're not, so I don't don't necessarily uh, think that that's a very there's much evidence for that or or eternal i mean I, i've no idea how am i supposed to evaluate something that's eternal i've only been around for a, a few decades not to no idea no idea above my pay grade not my problem don't sort of care too much anymore these days i'm like what well, you know people have been trying to work it out for centuries and millennia and you can fall on either side of the fence so i'm not going to be the one who works it out not not my job I am actually 100% confident that there's no God. 
certain, however you put it. I remember when I was really young being largely, um, I guess the philosophers would call it agnostic about the, the question. But after, what has it been now, 30 years of looking into the question, I am 100% sure that there is no such being as God. Whatever my level of certainty is, Michael is welcome to change it. You see, it doesn't really matter whether I'm 50% sure or 53.14% sure, or 99% sure, or 100% sure. Michael believes there is a God, and he's welcome to change my level of certainty through the normal mechanisms that we all use to change our certainty about the things that exist in this universe. Let's have that conversation. It doesn't matter what my level of certainty is. If you think there's a God that can change my level of certainty, then let's have that conversation and stop dancing around the rest. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. I'm very similar. Uri is getting very close to answering the question himself. However certain anybody is about this question is largely irrelevant. Let's rephrase the question and ask about aliens. I have no idea what my certainty is about aliens existing on elsewhere in our universe. What I do want to know, what I'm really keen to know, what I absolutely wish I would know in my lifetime is what absolute measurable testable, detectable evidence that could possibly be for them being out there. That's the key thing that I want to know. I want something exciting like that, that I can read about, that I can see people investigating, and that I can find out about and learn about what the possibilities are in our universe. My belief, or whether it's negative or positive, about the existence of aliens is utterly irrelevant and, as far as I'm concerned, non-interesting. And this question is exactly the same. I'm not interested at all in giving a level of certainty. I just want something that I can tangibly work with. So I'd like to flip this question around the other way. Those of us who were Christians, what was our certainty that God existed when we were Christians? 100%. Yeah, same for me. I always had nagging doubts. Oh, always, 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 always. Because... There were always hospitals filled with those people who showed up on the Sunday prayer list. Surely, all of you that that went to church had the Sunday prayer list. It came out in the newsletters, right? Here are the people in our congregation that need prayer. And I took that seriously. I prayed for those people for, for years. For years, I took our little Sunday bulletin, and I had a special prayer time after Sunday service, between the morning service and the night service. Uh, and, And I would pray for the people on that list. If you took God's ability seriously, even if you didn't believe in miracles, even if you thought it was providential care, we put those people in those bulletins expecting to have an outcome that was different from the norm. And I never saw it. And so, you know, we just rationalized it as we're in a fallen world, all the usual stuff, all the usual apologetics. And that's what I mean. You just bought it. So for me, it didn't reduce the, the probability from, of God. There was no other reason why we were here, our purpose and where we went when we died. They were just like certain. So, you know, certain things not working out right now on Earth. That was kind of mostly justifiable for a, for a long time until it just gets too much. Until you're just like, nah, that is too much suffering. I'm out <laughs> at that yeah. point. <laughs> You're right. You, you were a better Christian than I was, I think. Uh, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm not being tongue in cheek. I'm serious. You were probably a better Christian than I was. But it did always cause me real angst. I don't know how David felt about this. We come from very, very, very similar uh, religious traditions. David, how did you feel about the prayer list in the bulletin? Uh, I thought the prayer list was BS. Um, in the same way that I thought that people who would come up front and ask for, you know, that the church forgive them for some unmentioned sin was also BS because why do you keep committing it? And and then the prayer list, weren't you on there last week? There's no difference between time on the prayer list and time off the prayer list or, you know, before you went on, after you went on, and there's no difference in the amount of sin that people sinned and kept having. I tried not to think too hard about that kind of stuff. But as far as the question of my certainty when I was a Christian, I don't know that I ever thought about it in terms of percentage. Uh, I was certain enough to to be kept in line, at least for a while. 
um, you know, I was, I was Pascal certain enough. And I think that that's all that mattered. And at some point the wager wasn't so appealing anymore, but I'm pretty sure I had always had the same doubts that all Christians have. You know, you can't speak to a Christian who doesn't have some story about, oh, yes, I had these doubts. Right? Once, but okay, well, that's a pretty common occurrence because it's a very unlikely story that we've believed in. But there is some aspect of the story that keeps us in line, whether it's, you know, hoping to see our loved ones again who have died or we want to go to heaven and get out of this terrible life and, you know, have a life where you know, we're respected or wealthy or healthy, or, you know, we, we fear hell, you know, whatever, there's something that keeps the faithful faithful. And so I had enough certainty for that. Well, Matthew, what we're learning is that there were a lot better Christians on this show than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew you were not a backslider, you know. <laughs> so that's, that, that's me. That is, that is me all the way to the ground. Right. Does that well, Darren, me? Yeah, well, Darren, I've got a, a different question for you, obviously, because you were never a believer. So let me try and paint a picture and see if we can get some kind of teasing answer from you that touches on what I've just asked the other guys. So let's imagine there's a massive prayer survey of a, an enormous number of people, let's say 100,000 people. What percentage of those people would see some kind of response that correlates to prayer would there have to be in order for you to take the God proposition seriously? Is that a fair question, I guess? Um, I'm not sure that any amount would, whether it was zero or 100% or, or what would really matter to me, because the important part of that is not that someone thinks that the supernatural helped them out. It's what they can do to demonstrate that what, they th what they're thinking is actually correct. I guess the question for me would be how many people that could verify that their prayer was actually answered in a, in a supernatural way, just one. I mean, if they can verify that it was actually supernatural, then you start learning what the supernatural is and how it works and what it's capable of. And then you can build up from there to see if a God is even a real possibility. So yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does, because that feeds exactly into the aliens thing that I said earlier. I don't need or even want a statistical probability of all those planets out there, and they really must be on the laws of probabilities, another planet out there. All I need is just one which has evidence of industry that we can detect in the atmosphere of that planet. That would probably be good enough for me and i think you're giving a similar kind of answer in terms of the detection of god you just need that one positive case and that will be good enough you don't want to play a probabilities game yeah all, all they have to do is demonstrate that what they're claiming is actually true yeah yeah matthew i'm, I'm interested in something you said there i won't take long on this i'm just curious about your thought process suppose we found bacterial life and we may well do find something like bacterial life on other planets or at least evidence that it existed in the past in the atmosphere of venus is a is a realistic possibility the uh the the dust on mars is another real possibility for you to agree that there was alien life is it enough for it to be uh, single-celled or very simple multi-celled organisms? Or would the only way you accepted alien life, as a Christian, I mean, if it had been bacterial life, would that not have qualified for you? Does it have to be organized intelligence for it to be alien life? And, and, if it, and what would the difference have been? Because I do have an answer to that. That's a really good question. I'd never thought of it in the way that you'd said it. So thank you for posing it to me in a novel way for me. As a Christian, bacterial life would not have been good enough for me. It wouldn't have been satisfactory enough. I'd have found a way to explain it. Either God did it or it's just the natural process, but it's not life as we know it. So therefore it can't count. Here and now, as somebody who's no longer Christian, for finding bacteria, let's just say we find bacteria in the atmosphere of Venus. What I would want is to see a sample return and then some kind of analysis of that bacteria to confirm that it's not rogue bacteria from us that somehow got across. Mm -hmm. So I'd want that stage validated first. And if we could confirm that it wasn't, it was bacteria that was sufficiently different from 
what we have on this planet, then that would be good enough for me. But obviously what I would really love, the gold prize is intelligent alien life that has their own industry. That would be perfect. Yeah. David, I don't know. You think about this kind of thing a lot. Do you have a different thought there? We've had this kind of conversation. So no, I'm I'm with Darren here. I think he um said it very well. Uh, I don't need a percentage of things to happen. I just need one uh that's well demonstrated to happen. You know, in the scientific endeavor, you uh if you have a theory, you don't need a thousand disproofs of the theory before you accept it as disproven. You only need one scientifically offered disproof that has been peer reviewed, that has been tested, you know, that other, other people can do the experimentation, that sort of thing. Um, so you, but then you don't have one, right? You, you do have repeatability if other people can do the test. I think that would still be one that, <laughs> you know, you have one, uh, mm -mm. right. It, before you can call it, it in a legitimate experience, uh, experiment, even if a thousand people tested, I think that the, the credit would still go to the person who brought it. Yeah, but I'm not talking about credit, though. I am actually talking about reproducibility, which is something very different from getting your name on the tagline in the footnotes of history. Put it in scientific terms. And so me too. There, there are a lot, for instance, who say, yeah, this thing came from God. Well, I don't consider that one that's not that's not one yet. <laughs> it's one when it's something that's verifiable and that that meets rigor. And and then I would say, okay, that's one. That would be enough. But we haven't had that. We're still waiting for that. If I understand Darren's answer, I vibe with that. I don't need uh, twenty percent or thirty percent or fifty percent. Although, if you're going to make me play the percentage game. I'm going to say it has to be 100% because it's God. You know, humans can do 98% if we try real hard, but I think it would take, it would take a, you know, a God doesn't fail, right? He's the thing that's reliable every time. And if you've got this prayer survey and only, you know, 62% are positive, well, you've got a 38% failure rate and you've got to explain why God is failing 38% of the time. So I just, I don't think that the percentage game is a good game to play at all. I certainly don't think it's a safe game for Christians to play. I agree. There was a case, wasn't there, unbelievable that they discussed once of a guy who had no organs or something inside. Something dramatic happened to his organs. They, they rearranged or grew back a liver or something like that. And that was kind of fairly definitive in terms of a... Some, something unusual that they couldn't explain. So I'm just thinking about your one example, David. I mean, if, if you could show, you know, proper MRIs or something of the inside of the organs before and after, and this new organ was there, then that is your one example. But I think there's so many, I need more than one example because the norm is that these things don't happen and there's hundreds of millions of people suffering in lots of different ways that aren't getting that one miracle. So even if that was proved to be a miracle or something we just don't understand, I think it does have to be fairly repeatable. Medical science would insist on multiple MRIs just to make sure mm. uh, that there wasn't a problem. Yeah, but if that could be done, uh, then if we the had that one, because, you know, the, 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 there was this case on, I remember listening to it on Unbelievable, and it was a little bit quite unusual that makes you sort of think, well, yeah, we haven't got an explanation for that. And after you've eliminated all the, well, it was the machine, it was the wrong, you know, the, the files got switched, somebody got confused, or um, if you could really prove that, I still wouldn't think, that. well, that's God, because I think you need more than one, because it's been just too much. Was this a guy that had the accident under the truck and it fell on him and it broke him open and he lost a significant chunk of his intestines and then the doctor said it yeah, grew back yeah. a, a week later or something like that? I think it was that one. I spent a long time researching that one uh, after it went out i really really went into as many places on the internet as i could find about that story and all i could find was multiple christian yeah. websites telling yeah. the same short version of that story and i could find no concrete detail about it all there were no x-ray images of him at all the the story was just the same repeated in multiple places and there was nothing of any quality no. that i could verify at all about the story. It's a really poor example of a story. There was just nothing there verifiable to work on. And I think that's the problem. This is why Darren and the others would reject this story because there's nothing to confirm mm -hmm. or validate about the story at all. The claim that he had stuff grow back 
is completely unverifiable. Right. That's, well, and that's a, uh, another bit of the problem here is Sarah actually said it, and I think sort of shied away from it. She said, well, it's not explainable or, or words to that effect. And if we have a single occurrence that we document well as an oddity, and Darren said this before, you can document a single occurrence all you want. But when you can't explain the single occurrence, you can't then attribute it to God. Exactly. It's that easy. You can have an anomaly all you want. It can be tested and documented. You can have before and after pictures. You can have as much evidence as you want for what the thing is. And unless you can identify the cause, you can't attribute it to God. The only thing that I wanted to add to that and caution, uh, Sarah, and just anyone else listening, uh, some of us have chased down like like Matt. I've, I've done uh, similar things, too. You've chased down stories like that because that's interesting. That piques my interest. It's not like, well, I hear this story and I'm just going to discard it because I don't want to believe in God. I do as uh, much due diligence as I can. I used to do a lot more of it than I do now. But every time you chase it down, every time time, bar none, you find, okay, Sarah, you heard it on Unbelievable. Did you see this evidence? No, you didn't. You heard it on Unbelievable people giving testimony that they saw this evidence. Okay, well, where's the evidence? Well, let's look for this evidence. Okay, I have found a story about a story of a person who talked about this, but now the story is a little bit different. The details are a little bit different. Oh, well, the x-rays were actually unclear, or the healing the person was walking, ah, it was only temporary, but they're back in a wheelchair now. Or it, it's always something when you take the trouble to chase this stuff down and so Christians, if you just listen to them talk, it sounds like they're giving all this documented evidence. You can read Craig Keener's big book of miracles all day long, and you will never be able to verify a single claim, which is one of the reasons why Craig Keener started using as a kind of an evidence, well, all of these people said that something happened, so something must have happened because all of the claims, kind of using the claims as evidence. You know why they have to use claims as evidence? Because they don't have evidence as evidence. I agree with that. That's definitely when you start chasing these things down, they, do, don't, they don't tend to pan out. But I, I was just sort of suggesting that if there was one that, you know, a doctor was happy to certify and they've, they've done the due diligence and things you then you've just got that one example and it's just something that we can't explain i don't necessarily think it would prove what you and darren were saying might be enough to give you that one example that god did it yeah sarah's right the problem with using these kind of quote-unquote evidences to try to prove your point is this really boils down to an argument from ignorance or maybe a god of the gaps type argument we don't know what it is therefore magic and until you can prove that your magic, for one, actually exists, and two, is capable of doing these types of things, then once you've noted down the weird thing, that's as far as it goes. You noted it down, okay? That's as far as it goes because you cannot get from there to magic without making a leap. And we don't know how it was done, therefore magic just isn't good enough. A couple of episodes back for those listeners who want to see what real scientific investigation of some of these miracle claims look like. A couple of episodes back, we had a, a close friend of the show, uh, Professor Brian Blaze, on to talk again about miracles. And there was a, a longish segment in that show where Brian goes through how he has investigated some of these miracle claims as a professional scientist, uh, uh, step by step. And uh, not only how he does the investigation, but why Christian miracle claims are the weakest kind of evidence, the kind of evidence that scientists simply don't accept when they make scientific claims. So if you haven't listened to that show, with Professor Brian Blaze, I'll ask Matthew to drop that in the show notes. It's an episode. But you can always get around it, as William Lane Craig did this, was it this week, when he said... Uh... If it's really, really nice and you really hope it's true, then you can just lower the bar. And if it's a tiny percentage chance that it might be true, you should believe it. And that was that's the way you can get around it if you want. <laughs> yeah. No, my child really doesn't have Down syndrome. I really don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Dr. Craig. <laughs> Nearly halfway there. Question four. Do you believe 
that science can provide answers for many of the remaining mysteries of the universe, including how the universe began, including where matter came from and where the Big Bang derived its energy, the origin of life and DNA coding. These questions are not meant to stump us. Who wants to bite at that one? I think we probably all want to bite at that one. <laughs> I would say that um, eventually, yes, science is going to be able to answer a lot of these questions. I mean, they've already got designs for drives that can go faster than the speed of light. We're not quite sure if these drives would actually work or not, but given enough energy, the math says that they should. And if they do, then we can get far enough ahead of where the light is that we can go ahead and actually watch at the past, <laughs> uh, humanity's past. And if we get far enough out, we could probably what watch the uh, formation of the earth. So yeah, I forget the, I can never say the name without actually butchering, butchering it, but um, have you- Mikhail uh, Akubieri. Uh, Mikhail uh, Akubieri. Akubieri is, is one of the, drives that has been kicked around in the NASA advanced propulsion seminars, at least according to the things I've read. So there's yeah. one, there may be others. That one's fairly impractical because it requires a lot of exotic matter that we're not even sure even exists, but they've been uh, working on his formulation and gotten it down to, I mean, it's real matter that we know exists for the energy that will make it work. Granted, it's about the uh, same amount as exists in the entire solar system, so we're not quite there yet, but at least it's real matter at this point. <laughs> mm. And as far as the beginning of the universe, I don't know. That's just I think that's beyond any information that we can receive. So unless we learn how to hop universes. Yeah, I mean, it's unlikely we can prove multiverses just because of the practicalities, but you know, we might do one day. We might be able to find a way of, of doing these things. It's certainly that's the way things are going. I mean, that's the way it's moved in yeah. theory. We haven't gone, oh, I must turn to the Bible more and more as, as more discoveries are made. We tend to not, you know, start saying, well, that's now allegory <laughs> or it's now just a story or it's because, uh, so, you know, it gets embarrassing. We know the, the earth wasn't done in seven days and there's no firmament above the, above the sky and things like that. So every time there's a discovery, it's pushing, it generally pushes back on the ancient thinking and, and closes the God of the gaps argument smaller and smaller. It only seems to have gone one way, not, not the other. There are no scientific findings or explanations of, the way the world works that have been made by the Bible, I would say, compared to science yeah. and education and knowledge and yeah, experimentation. So, yeah. yeah, and it's not like we don't understand DNA coding either. <laughs> I mean, we even pretty much understand uh, the beginning of the origin of life. But we haven't put all the pieces together and they're all sort of like a puzzle that we haven't put together yet. But I mean, it's not like DNA coding some big mystery I and mean, it's basically just chemistry. And saying God did it doesn't get an actual investigation closer to an answer. You can say uh, God created the universe by an act of great power, okay? But that doesn't actually tell you anything meaningful. And so saying God does something in regard to DNA coding doesn't get us any closer to an answer about, uh, let's just say it was a big mystery, Darren. Sorry, I'm, I'm not uh, taking away from what you said because I entirely agree. But let's just say that DNA coding was some sort of big mystery. Saying God did it wouldn't be an answer to the question. It would be an entire avoidance of an answer because it wouldn't give us any information. And we can go even further than that with this question because the, the question is, do you believe science is going to give us these answers? Well, Belief and knowledge are different parts of the map. So I can say I believe something. That doesn't mean that I know the thing that I say I believe. Knowledge is a different kind of claim. Do I believe science will give us answers to big questions? Uh, yes, I do, but it, it may not. It may not. But if it does, whatever the answer is, I don't have any knowledge of that answer at the moment. Whatever the big question is that we don't have an answer to, even if I believe science will give us an answer, there's no knowledge about the framework of that answer. Did it come in the form of a mathematical proof? Did it come in the form of uh, chemistry and elements that we haven't yet discovered? 
Uh, did it come as the result of some technological advancement? What sort, what is the shape of the answer? Well, that's what knowledge is, is the shape of an answer. And belief doesn't give us any shape. It's not that long ago that we used to think life was animated by some sort of thing called Elan Vital, is it? I mean, we just, uh, we had no explanation for the biological systems. And then slowly we chip and chip and chip away at the, at the problem. And we understand the biological processes. And, uh, we, you know, it has a multi-dimensional functional explanation as to why there are things that are alive. It's not this mysterious Elan Vital. And I think it will go the same way for, for many, many things. The, you know, the beginning of life, uh, conscious or whatever we, we try and explain, uh, we'll look back in 200 years time and, and just think, oh, wasn't it cute? They used to think that uh, consciousness just arose when actually they dissolved the hard problem of consciousness and, and uh, explained it by lots and lots of little mechanisms and a different way. Where is David? I'm here. David, are you a science believer? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat that as the real question because I, I think that the thing I didn't want to let happen with this question was to let the real question slip past. This is a trick question. This is a typical, uh, Christians ask this question uh, in lots of different ways, and they're just trying to get at uh, establish one or two things. They're trying to establish that, you see, here are some mysteries of the universe, and yet you have faith in something that ultimately can't be proven. Uh, you see, you're, it's just like Christianity. You have faith in your atheist things. Another way this question is asked is to say, oh, you believe that science is the knowledge answer to, to everything, and so you are scientistic, and you're considering that there might be answers to these great mysteries elsewhere, and, and yet you have faith that science is going to give you those answers. So it's a disingenuous question, and I just didn't want the true nature of this question by Dr. Brown to be uncommented. And so I think my contribution is to say, this is what he's really getting at. I don't feel like I need to address the answer, but I, I guess I will say I'm happily scientistic until someone gives me another way of, uh, of gaining knowledge about these things. It's just the only show in town uh, that I know how to access. So show me how to access some other form and uh, we'll give that a try. I'm perfectly happy to trip that trap. They want to try to explain how we get to the moon using the Bible. Then uh, I'll let them flounder around with that. Oh, no, I can tell you the answer to that one. Stick a whole bunch of them in the drive and light them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is you oh, take God. the hands for the ark and you just turn it on its end. <laughs> what's, what's your problem? Everybody knows that the secret to uh, biological life is... That's fair enough. Okay, okay. There's, there's, there's a non sequitur somewhere in there. Uh, Matthew, what about you? You're, you? Science is a big thing for you. Do you believe... Look, I, I'm on record. Uh, belief and knowledge, very different things. Silly, silly to confuse them. But do you, Matthew Taylor, believe science? Well, give us answers. Well, yes, I believe science will give us answers because it gives us answers every day. I mean, look at the answers it has given us in the last uh, two and a half, three years regarding vaccines and uh, the coronavirus. Science gives us answers all the time. Will it give us all the answers to the things that are listed here? And let me just see if I can bring them up. How the universe began, where matter came from, where the Big Bang got its energy, the origin of life and the DNA coding. Well, some of those things are a little bit awkward because where matter came from is a problematic statement in itself because what we understand with science at the moment is that matter or rather energy from which matter get, comes is neither created nor destroyed so that it can't have come from anything it's just a transformation from an energy state into into a physical state so do i believe that science will give us these kinds of answers yes because it's got a proven track record do I believe that it will give us the answer to absolutely every question we ever want to know? Well, that becomes more awkward and that becomes more difficult because sometimes we'll ask questions which are irrelevant or, or inappropriate. So, yes, I have a belief in science, but it's no, not in any way, shape or form equivalent to 
a religious belief, which is, again, what this question is trying to tap in there. And that word belief right at the beginning, do you believe that science? It's there intentionally, it's there designed to equate the acceptance of the conclusions of science and the, the rigorous study which brings out the results of science. It's an attempt to equate all of that hard work with religious belief. And th that is absolutely not a thing. So I have a follow-on question in case you tag Dr. Brown on Twitter or David, because he loves the guy, you know, <laughs> sends him an email. Uh, I, I do have a follow-on question that hopefully uh, he can answer. And that question is this for listeners. If science doesn't give us an answer to one of these big questions, how does God do better in giving us the answer? Yeah, that's a good one. I will leave that one hanging. I need a mic drop sound effect. Question five. Have you had any experiences in your life that caused you to question your atheism? Notice where he's going with that one. Has something happened to you that seemed genuinely supernatural or otherworldly? Or have you been confronted with some information that shook your atheistic foundations, such as oh, a scientific so argument for that's intelligent so design? Try not to laugh. <laughs> if so, how have you dealt with such doubts to your atheism? Oh, hilarious. Remember, these are it's honest like questions, guys. Question Calm means. down. These are honest questions. Come on, It's like guys. he's never spoken to somebody who doesn't believe. Has he ever come outside of his bubble? I mean, it's just bizarre. I don't, did I have? I, like, I don't even know what this question means because the way I hear this question. So you don't believe in God. Did you ever have anything so traumatic and so uh, personally shattering that it made you believe in God? <laughs> it's, it's a very strange question. Uh, do, do, any, do, do any of the rest of you, sometimes I hear questions sort of oddly, do any of you hear that question differently? I'm, I'm going to hold my fire on this one. I, I have a, like a one minute closing statement. Uh, yes, I just... one minute. Gonna, I'm going to play my other pass card. I pass. <laughs> <laughs> one minute really i'm dubious it's a david minute we all know oh. what those we all know what those david's, look like david standard time i got it yeah yeah darren how do you look i'm serious when i say i don't understand the question the question seems very muddled and confused to me because i do understand what could happen that would shake my christian foundation right i do understand what that means because i understand uh if there was a god I understand how the world we live in could look like that God not being good and, th and that God actually being evil. So I do understand what it means to have this kind of question that can shake your Christian foundations. I actually don't understand what it means to say you had something happen that shakes your atheist foundations. I, I really don't understand that. And uh, if one of you guys can clear it up, I'm, I'm interested. Well, it's almost as if, Andrew, you're saying that your atheism is not held as a belief the same way that your Christianity was. Oh, did I say that? Okay, good. Like I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll hang on to that. That, that. Look, I liked it a lot better the way you said it than the way I almost said it. But <laughs> <laughs> just Darren, in Darren case it about. wasn't, just in case it wasn't obvious. Yeah, it's, so I guess, it, well, it, look, it wasn't even obvious to me. Uh, <laughs> Darren, what about you? How do you hear this question? It's I mean, it's obviously a, a biased question, but I've heard this from so many different Christians that I sort of understand it because Christians, or at least the ones that uh, argue on the internet, seem to think that atheism is a worldview. So if you look at this question as cause you to question your worldview, I think it becomes a lot more clear. Because, you know, when do a little diversion here, Christianity over in first world countries is actually shrinking. And the only reason Christians can claim that the religion is actually expanding is because it's expanding pretty quickly in the third world countries where there is a lot of hardship, things like uh, a lot of mental duress. And they do believe in the supernatural and they believe it does things. So they're more likely to believe that they've been confronted with uh, some sort of supernatural or otherworldly something. I think that's what this question is getting at. You know, do you, you know, if I was to put it in quote unquote atheistic terms, 
I would probably have it something that caused you to question your atheism and have you been so gullible as to think that uh, what's happening to you is supernatural in nature. But, you know, that's sort of how I read it because I don't think any person that has a reliable means to distinguish fact from fiction would go from atheism to Christianity. That's probably just my bias talking, so... I think it just shows the complete lack of understanding of any of this. It's like they've never been outside their Christian bubble. None of the question makes any sort of sense. I mean, have you had experiences like that cause you to question your atheism? For some, atheism, for some people, it's just not holding a belief in God. Maybe they just can't be bothered. They're not interested. It's not something that rings their bell. So why would this, this it's not built on any particular foundations necessarily. So why would anything shake it particularly? I, th- I think he means, do you occasionally think there might be a God? That's how I read it and how I take it. Do you occasionally? Mm. I know. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the way it's You're being so just, charitable. Uh, it doesn't theory. make sense. But um, do you sometimes think, oh, I could be wrong. There might be a God. Well, yeah, but. So, yes, yeah, I, I, I don't, it's, it's just a lack of, I don't go through the motions of belief. I don't go to church every week. I don't pray to a God. I don't do all those things anymore. That's just what I mean. I don't even really think I like being described as atheistic, particularly. I don't, why be described by something you don't believe? It's just, I'm agnostic. I don't know. So, you know, you just, no, you don't, nothing's shaking your foundations any more than just generally evaluating worldviews all the time or your beliefs or looking at things in, from a different perspective on an, on a regular ongoing basis. But there's no, yeah, and, and it's cute. The, the scientific argument for intelligent design has definitely not shaken my atheistic foundations. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of hard for something that doesn't exist to shake your foundations. <laughs> exactly. That's the best line of the show right there. That's, that's, uh, that's got my vote. Something that doesn't exist, sh- shaking your atheistic foundations that don't exist to make you believe in something that doesn't exist either, God. So, now, yeah, now my brilliant. head hurts. <laughs> Matthew, I this to say, it is, it, regular listeners have heard this over and over and over and over and over. It fits here. You want to you shake my atheistic foundation. We've had people that make miracle claims on this show. And in fact, some of them have been silly enough not to look up my backstory <laughs> before they... Uh, started waving the miracle stick on mine. So here's how you can shake my <clears throat> atheistic foundation. I have a prosthetic. I have an extended community of lots of people with prosthetics. We will happily participate in any experiment where your God does the things that some of you say he can do. For a longer history of that challenge, see any other show that we've done, really. You can shake my atheistic foundations, but it's pretty high bar. Yeah, but can they shake your miracle stick? Oh, oh, yeah, that is the miracle stick. Oh, Oh, hey, it's a damp squib, too. For those of you who are listening who are under 18, please press pause now, move on to the next episode. (laughs) Or Matthew will suddenly talk about his struggle. <laughs> oh, I'm shaking miracle sticks. Look, I, look I, I don't know about uh, shaking miracle sticks, but I have a really strong suspicion that Matthew is going to shake the edit stick. On this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to bring the goat back from that previous oh, that was episode. Good that was good. Uh, okay, so um, atheistic foundations, I think, pretty well handled, right? Yeah, we see. I've got an observation to make here. Way back in question one, where there was a question about, are you atheist based on study or experience? And we know that the hidden agenda behind question one is, if you try to say that you've rejected belief in religion for your current state of atheism based on experience, that there is a rejectable option there. It means the Christian can now reject you as as not being very intellectual they can reject you as just going on experience they can reject you because you've gone something on a whim Mm. now we get to this question and he wants to challenge your inverted commas belief in atheism because you've had experience and if you're doubting it based on experience now you're being dishonest to yourself now you're so firm in your belief that you won't let a little experience shake you off because you're so fixed in in that belief. There really is a double tongue going on here. And this is what happens when people like Dr. Michael Brown say that they've got honest questions to ask you because one, they're never honest. 
And two, you need to look for where he's trying to trap you because this is exactly what he's doing. So you think he's dishonest. I've said he's yeah. dishonest. I'm pretty sure Sarah and Darren. I'd say naive. <laughs> naive. Oh, she's, she's the nice one. <laughs> We're going to get you over I'm that ledge, Sarah. Charity. We're going to get you over that ledge. Oh, don't get me wrong. I can't bear <laughs> it, but um, he's. But I, but I honestly think he just comes across like he's never met a non-believing person in his life, and it's just, <laughs> just staggering, really. But no, I think he's just. Uh, I think they're on. I mean, every single one of those questions really has. So come to Jesus at the end of, of them, really, don't they? Just come to Jesus. That's what he really wants to, to, to tag on to each of the questions. But it, they're just, they're bizarre. They're bizarre. They don't even make necessarily any, any yeah. sense. They're so steeped in the worldview. We can't even think outside the box. Oh, I bizarre. actually said yeah. that to our guest last week. That's, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ooh, that's, <laughs> Matthew, what um, question yeah, was that? Was that five or six? Well, this is question five. David's still got his, his time out uh, right. hanging over for this question. But there's just one more thing I'd like to say about this question. <laughs> is There's a basic assumption here, and this is something that is seen an awful lot from high-level public apologists like Dr. Michael Brown and others, right the way down to, to lay Christians, because I fought this multiple times when Andrew and I did, and Darren did Alpha. Is that two years ago or three years ago now that we did uh, Alpha and recorded various episodes on that? I spoke about this in a small group in Alpha when we did it. And it's this basic thing that atheism is a belief on the same level as religious belief. And there is something about the way Christianity is taught Mm -hmm. that it leads to this mm -hmm. wrong belief that people like us, whether it's Darren who's never been religious or whether it's us who are heathens, that the atheism that we hold is a belief system on the same level as Christianity. We may as well believe in something mm -hmm. supernatural. The natural may as well be our God that we believe in on a whim. It's as though all of the hard work of science to explain things going on doesn't exist it's as though the studies that they do the literary studies they do of the bible the studies they do of study books of the bible it's though though all of that stuff is the equivalent intellectually of meticulous white-coated science laboratory work and they're not equivalent under any measure that you could try but that belief persists at all levels of christianity and this is the rottenness that this question comes out of. And it's deeply frustrating to see. And sometimes when I'm feeling charitable, I take Sarah's view and say they just don't know any better because they've been seeped in it for so long, they don't get it. And sometimes, like I'm feeling tonight, I feel that these guys do it intentionally. They know it. They're not so stupid as to not know this, but they are so vested into their belief that they cannot and will not accept any other option. David, have you said anything over this? Or are you still holding the red card? We'll keep my powder dry. I will say that I really appreciate uh, Matt's uh, getting at the heart of the question. I did a show, I don't know, one or two years ago, and it was a 10-question style show, but not quite like this one because you, you guys have cornered the market on this one. So what I did is I took the 10 questions and I ignored the questions pretty much and just explained the trick behind the questions because there's always a trick behind the questions. Um, and so this is this is what Christians are, internet apologists are actually getting at when they ask these questions sort of thing. Uh, so I, th I just think it's important. You can, you can answer the question and take it, the question as seriously as you like, but don't think that there is a sincere inter, uh, interlocutor on the, at the other end of it. Dr. Michael Brown, if you heard that, you have an open invocation to Still Unbelievable to defend the fact that you are an honest interlocutor. You've heard some of our answers. In fact, if you want to fight with David again, because lots of people like to fight with David, we'll happily host that confrontation <laughs> here, here on, on Still Unbelievable. But uh, David, I tend to agree that there are tricks behind these questions, and we spend a lot of time exposing them, uh, thanks to Matthew's hard work when he finds these questions for atheists. So uh, well done, Matthew. 
nearly there and we're not even close to four hours what has gone on we need to have these guests back more often Andrew that's what it is yes question six are you completely materialistic in your mindset <coughs> meaning human beings are entirely physical human consciousness is an illusion and there is no spiritual uh, of any kind or are you superstitious reading horoscopes or engaging in the new age practices or the like okay. i'm definitely a like kind of person. I, I call poison Thanks. i i call poison <laughs> Uh, I call poison because he deliberately, unless, uh, you know, so either he deliberately did it or he's a victim of Christianity or he's an idiot. Given that the last two are worse, he deliberately poisoned that question by talking about illusions as you know, your consciousness as an illusion, et cetera, et cetera. So I call poison and that's my answer. You guys can have it. I'll go ahead and answer this one briefly. Uh, yes, I am completely materialistic. I am 100% materialistic. That said, there's a word in this question that maybe someone will jump in, the spiritual. You, you know, the question is, do you completely deny the spiritual? And he kind of puts everything that's metaphysical on the side of spiritual. So I would just ask, what do you mean by spiritual? What what is that? How do you define it? Do you do you define spiritual as every aspect of nature that you can't easily explain with matter? Because I would say that that's a spiritual of the gaps at that point. What do you mean by spiritual? And maybe I'd have a better chance of answering the question. But as far as things that I know about, yes, I think that there are material explanations for all of it. By the way, so did the people in the first century. Jesus ascended because they thought heaven was a physical place. Yeah. Uh, this this notion of spirituality, spirituality is a little Johnny come lately. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah um, I'm going to make Darren very happy here because um, uh, <laughs> when he said, are you completely materialistic? I would have said, no, I'm happy to be to entertain the idea of, um, you know, some sort of panpsychism, idealism as an option, maybe. Not that I necessarily know that whether that's true. I just kind of hope it might be and it might be a nice way to view the world. Darren and I have discussed this many times and he gets very frustrated because I won't nail my, my colors on my the mask completely in terms of what I believe in this because it's not a bad belief. It's just it, it may be a, a, an option or it may not be. I'm increasingly thinking it probably isn't having just read a book on consciousness and this poor man michael brown is very confused for starters he calls about human consciousness well you know we know that primates are conscious as well it means that you're having an experience um, of some sort okay we have got a better ability for reflection and self-awareness and we've got a higher amount of brain power but it's in terms of it being an illusion it actually may well be according to some of the latest neuroscience on this i had a friend i was at uni at uh, uh, school with who's gone on to become a bit of a a champion in this area, uh, quite well respected. And uh, I've just read his book on, on the matter. And I think uh, he says it's all Bayesian probability from the top down approach that um, is from your brain that's being informed of all the things you've dealt with in the past, uh, you've uh, encountered in the past. And it's, um, and it's making predictions constantly and updating them constantly so that you actually sort of kind of create the world around you. So when you look at a cup and you think it's 3D, it's because your brain's already telling you light, you know, hitting this side and that side. Is is, this is likely to be a 3D object and you're constantly refining that view as you're looking around in split seconds you know uh, it's happening very very quickly but this idea that you know you've got this consciousness is possibly and this self-awareness and things is, is possibly a way that the brain gives you this perception of having been a stable thing through time where in actual fact everything the body's changing constantly but um, the brain is constantly making predictions that we should be a stable unit in time and it's actually when you see things go wrong in psychologically where people you know have this Junction with reality and start having psychosis and things it's actually the brain's still doing its thing it's just not working as well as it should be so he might actually be quite right when he says human consciousness is an illusion because it may well be the case as is free will um, in which case christians are pretty stuffed when that comes to that because you take out free will and the entire thing collapses so and in terms of armor superstitious reading no 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 people the only person that we know about that was teddy who was a christian who did astrology wasn't it of some sort that she believed in um, but no, no, why would I want to believe in any of those things? Not particularly. Aaron. Okay. I would just like to say that in uh, Sarah's defense, I am kind of an asshole. So she's too, <laughs> she's too nice to say it, but luckily I'm not. 
<laughs> hey, hey, it plays well on mic, though, man. It's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's greater up here. So again, this the wording of this is kind of weird. I don't know what it means when people say that consciousness is an illusion because it's real. Illusion sort of has connotations that it's not real, that it doesn't exist. I mean, we can quibble about. I, I think about they mean sense, a sense of self and um, a first. Yeah, all those things are created by the brain. It's not like a consciousness in terms of a, a different matter arising. In which case, you should be on the side of that because you don't believe in in consciousnesses arriving. You do believe it's a product of the brain, which, according to my friend's book, it pretty much is. Right, but I don't believe that it being a product of the brain makes it an illusion. No, okay, no, no, no. So, yeah, I don't actually understand what people mean when they say it's an illusion if it's a product of the brain. But I am completely materialistic. Until someone can show me that something other than material actually exists, I see no reason to believe that it does exist. Um, but, you know, if someone can show that it actually exists, and I'd be more than happy to take a look at it. I, think, I find this last paragraph questionable because if he's equating new age practices as superstition, then he'd have also have to equate Christianity as a superstition as well. Yeah. If he's being consistent. Well, which... I think that's a, I think that's another question that, that he ought to be, if new age spiritualism, just to say the question, if new, if new age spiritualism is not real, however you gloss that, what separates Christianity from new age realism, uh, from new age spiritualism? I, I would love to see an answer to that question. Uh, well, as far as I can tell, the answer is, Different people made up different stories. Because the, the Bible tells me so. And there you go. One of the things that confused me, I, I appreciate Sarah, you doing research. Sarah cannot help do research for shows, which is why I don't like giving her notes. Because then she would just research. <laughs> Unresearched version of Sarah. But I, um, I do appreciate, <laughs> because she always drops a bit of knowledge. Uh, but this idea that consciousness... It, or mind is something different than matter. That's something that I don't think I've ever understood because whatever you mean by mind, it still seems to require matter and maybe material of some other kind, but it's still matter. What you're telling me is that if you somehow disassembled the universe by constituent parts and there was no more matter of any kind, there would still be mind without a brain to house it. I mean, we can talk about my thoughts and you can say, well, my thoughts are not material, but my thoughts are absolutely material. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely material and they can be manipulated materially. And so I just, it does not compute to me the idea that our inner lives, as it were, was somehow separate from the matter that is us. Well, that's what they're, they're starting to, yeah, that's what they're thinking. That, again, it's going back to the Elan Vital, in, uh, where they just describe the issue. Of, let's go back. Uh, this chappy here, uh, Michael Brown, is the, the he's trying to just to sort of show that the human consciousness is a bit of an issue in terms of it can't just come from the brain. It's got to be a special thing. What he's trying to smuggle in there that we all know is soul and spirit and all this kind of uh, aspect. And, yes, there is no now any proof that, that we can see a, an interaction problem with uh, with the spirit acting on material things. So the, he's got that to demonstrate firstly. The main thing is he's trying to make this mysterious consciousness. And again, like the Alain Vital, I think we are going to slowly chip away at it. We're going to dissolve that problem rather than solve it in one big go. It will be, you know, we now know that the brain makes tons and tons of predictions all the time, that it gives you the sense of self. They know where, you know, that that's happening and uh, it's got an internal clock, but that's actually relates a little bit to how much experience you're having. If you're having a very boring day, time will tend to go differently than if you're learning lots and lots of things. That's why as kids, we feel like time stretched out for ages and ages because we were in absorbing so much information that it was very varied all the time. Whereas if you had leading a home drum life, you know, six months have gone past before you kind of realize. So, and all these things are built into it and we're slowly chipping away at the ex explanation of consciousness. And so it may not be this big mystery in the future. And that was very sad because then panpsychism might not be true. <laughs> I just don't see the problem with that. Well, it's a nice hold. It's a nice holding place. It's a stepping stone place. You know, you can you can sort of think. Well, it just gives a bit of woo to life. Why not? That's all. I appreciate um, your honesty. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of mystery. It'd be sweet. It'd be kind of nice if it all if we all came from mind and you know all these traditions that say that we all kind of we are one and we all go back to the big cosmic slush in the sky later. That's all kind of 
cosmic and we all become one and that and it you know all these little stories have been weaving their way through time in all cultures and that would be kind of nice but you know if it's not the case then it's not the case it's i don't have to believe it isn't the truth more fantastic than fiction Whenever we discover, to me, I, I just out on a limb here, but to me, when we find an explanation for the way the world is, like evolution, when we find that evolution is composed of some fundamental things like mutation and allele frequency and natural selection, when, when we find these actual explanations, that seems to me, in my mind, and I, again, I may be alone, but in my mind, that is more fantastic than the fictions that went before. Oh, okay, well, everybody you. just stopped. Was... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's because secretly nodding. we all want a bit more woo in our life. I mean, that's going to be the <laughs> takeaway phrase from this episode. You know, <laughs> all that attempt to be rational and scientific, and actually, it all boils down to we need more woo in more our woo lives. On we our do. Oh, like okay. <laughs> 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 no, am I am I alone? Do you do you guys not feel that way? No, you're not alone. You're not alone. My too. audio. Oh. No, you're there. We're just ignoring okay. you. Oh. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> what really worried me was that I had some technical difficulty that I didn't understand. I don't mind being ignored. Uh, so I can troubleshoot that. <laughs> so, uh, look, Sarah, I get it and I appreciate it. And I, I've never been to mistake uh, the wouldn't have, wouldn't it be nicest for what actually is, is, uh, I, Mm -hmm. a very fertile imagination and i think that i can imagine a world that's better than the one that we live in but that's irrelevant because i draw a hard line between what i wish would be and what i think actually is and i i, I just think that that's a discipline that we have to accept with you know as we mature and as we become i i did i just realized that i may have <laughs> sounded insulting uh, and condescending i didn't mean to oh no i'm not taking it that way no no I, I actually agree with you i'm not making a truth claim about any of these things i just think it would be nice if underpinning it all was the, the you know the story of consciousness sort of trying to learn about itself and exploring and developing and creating and you know it, it, that could be kind of a nice just nice way to view the world i don't necessarily know whether it's true or not i don't really i don't really mind it well I, it would be nice but i don't i don't think I, there's no way to prove it so i'm not too worried other than the philosophical arguments by someone like philip goff who you know, has some has some good points. So I just find it an interesting way to view the world, but it, you can't make a truth claim about it. Uh, Matthew, I need to make one correction quickly so that no one writes me an ugly email. Well, I'm probably going to get them anyway, but I have been saying allele frequency. I've said it a couple of times in this show, and each time I say it, I'm thinking genetic drift and saying allele frequency. So when I'm talking about evolution, three of the fundamental components is genetic drift, mutation, and the process of natural selection. And uh, so I just need to correct that before we uh, get to the end and I forget about it. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. And talking of the end, question seven, the last and final one. Let's see if we can get through with a nice, simple one to ride it out. Okay, <laughs> here we go. If you were convinced that God truly existed, meaning the God of the Bible, who is perfect in every way, full of justice and mercy, our creator and our redeemer. Would that be good news or bad news? And would you be willing to follow him and honour him if he were truly God? Right. Come, to to Jesus. This one. Come to Jesus. I, boy, I, did, I don't know. If it, is that really the picture of the God in the Bible? <laughs> because... Because, uh, exactly. Because the, the God that I read about in those pages, <laughs> he didn't look anything like that caricature that you just read. So, um, so uh, I, no. I got a, I got an answer, but I'll use that as a start. Uh, any, anybody else want a, a, a bite of, of that? Then no, you go. You you keep going, and we'll go around, and uh, I'll see. Oh, where okay. I All right. So I don't have any idea. I read the Bible. The God that I saw there is, I'm, I'm on record on this show. I'm on record on Unbelievable. I'm on record on uh, The Graceful Atheist. I'm on, I'm, I'm on record at Skeptics and Seekers. Uh, I'm, I'm on record in print. I'm on record all over the world saying that 
if the God of the Bible is the God that exists, and I, I don't think there is a God that exists, at least not that has been demonstrated to me, but if the God of the Bible existed, no, I wouldn't follow him. I wouldn't worship him. Uh, I would actively encourage other people not to follow him and not to worship him. And I would actually consider it my job, my duty, my contribution to humanity to hasten the end of this universe as much as I possibly could because the God of the Bible loses more souls to eternal hell than he wins. And by losing it on the end of the universe by one day, he maybe gets 10 souls, but I keep 100 out of hell. And so I consider that a win. If I can do my job to keep more people out of hell than he wins in heaven, then I actually think that's a better contribution than the Jesus Christ of the Bible ever made. So no, I wouldn't worship him. And as far as I'm concerned, he's deserving of the hell that is uh, painted in the New Testament. That's that's my story. I would largely in agreement with you because we've got two different gods being described here. There's the God of the Bible, which is a psychopathic evil deity. And if that God existed, then sure, I would follow him. I have absolutely no interest in being tortured for all eternity and better to be the evil psychopath's friend than uh, being tortured for all eternity. I know nothing. I know um, nothing. Sorry, Shilton. Better, better to be better to um, be friend. <laughs> and then if the uh, I mean we know that there's no perfect in any way full of justice and mercy creator or redeemer God because cancer exists. Well, we can just 100 percent sure know that that kind of God doesn't exist. But I suppose if he did, then he wouldn't require us to follow or honor him. So I might like honor him, but I don't know if I would follow him because that just wouldn't be his stick because he's like full of justice and mercy and perfect in every way. So assuming that he even knew that we existed, then um, I suppose I might follow him. I don't know that that kind of God would be either good or bad news, though. The uh, psychopath God described in the Bible would definitely be bad news. That's my answer to that. Oh, man. There's so much pre-sup in, in the question there that I, I can't, I'm sort of choking on it here. I mean, I know he's tried to define God in like three lines. Well done, Mr. Brown. The God of the Bible, whoopee. That, does, that doesn't tell me anything. Are we talking about Yahweh? Because in which case, no, he sounds as like Darren. Everyone has said he's, he's a bit psychotic. You'd need to spend a long time defining what you mean by, by God um, and to even see if people are agreeing on the definition because I think it's, it's too broad up to literally summarize in that God of the Bible. It's just not going to work for me, that one. And then if you mean Jesus, who's perfect and justice and mercy and all that kind of stuff, he's saying, you know, is it good news? And he's our redeemer and stuff. He's smuggling in a whole load of theology there that we're lost sinners, that we're de destined for hell, that we're so happy to have a redeemer and, you know, uh, a God that forgives us and things like that. I mean, you, 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 he's putting the horse, the horse before the cart hit cart before the horse even um in trying to smuggle all this information in this theology which no you know if it's just a god who's good and justice and nice and mercy and all that stuff yeah great it'd be mm. great that there's a god like that overlooking the whole universe that gives us some sort of eternal life maybe i'm not even convinced i want to eternal life yeah that's fine but he really he wants to say is it good or bad news i.e are you happy that he's going to save you from hell because that's where he really wants to send you so the, the question again is just poor would i be able to willing to follow him and honor him i, I don't know, even know what that means what does it mean to follow a god what does he think he's doing in, in terms of following a god does it mean living up to my highest ideal there's like Jordan Peterson would say, you know, you're, you're the your highest kind of judge in your head of your, of your ideals. And every time you fail, acts as a bit of a god to you. Is that what he means? I mean, again, too many words, not not well defined. The poor man is is confused. I don't think he knows what he means. Is he's not an easy one to answer. I'm with Sarah. There's so many possibilities. It's hard to answer the question as asked. Do you mean the God of the Bible as Peter? Uh, you know, our friend Peter sees it, uh, the God of the Bible right with an I sees it, the God of the Bible as Mac Attack sees it, the God of the Bible as Teddy sees it. These are different gods. I'm sorry, they don't think so, but they are. Um, what about the God as, as you read it? Yeah, so the God of the Bible as I read it, before I answer that directly, I do want to, as we've been doing throughout the show, show the trick here. Because what he really wants to say 
is, you know, it's kind of a test balloon. If I could prove that God exists, would you become a Christian? And if you say no, well, you see, you're already decided, and this is, you know, maybe why God doesn't show himself to you in the first place. The God of the Bible, as I understand it today, is a monster. And I think it would be very bad news even for Christians. If you look at the Jews who who were obsequious to God all the time, he wiped them out many times or allowed them to be in slavery many times. <laughs> you know, the old Jewish joke, God says, I'm going to make you my chosen people. And their representative says, hey, could you choose someone else? <laughs> you know, it's a terrible thing to be that God's chosen. Another way we could look at it is just look at the teachings of Jesus, and, and let's just forget about all the bad God. Are the teachings of Jesus? Well, that's what we do over on uh, Red Letters, patreon.com slash Red Letters. That's what we do over there, just looking at the teachings. Forget about whether there was a, a guy or not, or whether it was God. Just look at the teachings. Let's examine them a uh, little bit by little bit. As we do, those teachings are bad. And so that would be bad news if that was somehow how the world should be governed. And then the most direct of the questions that I think I can answer is, would you follow him? The answer is, I don't care what kind of God he was. I wouldn't follow him as in become a disciple and bend a knee. I wouldn't bend a knee to a king. I wouldn't bend a knee to a bully. You know, if I've got a best friend, I don't need to bend the knee mm -hmm. to the best friends. And so the question assumes that this God is someone that needs to be kowtowed to somehow. And that doesn't sound like good news to me at all. So no, I would never bend the knee regardless of how real he was and how nice a guy he was. Darren's a nice guy. Darren would be appalled if I bended the knee to him. So should this God. So I think this suggests just a kind of a Christian framing where, you know, God is in his heaven and we are the little ants that are his subjects that he allows us to live every day. So that framing in and of itself means that this God existing would be bad news, not just for us unbelievers. That's a given. He'd be bad news for you too, Christians. Matthew, before you answer, can I um, ask a question to Dr. Brown? Because I have a feeling that you'll tag him. Go for it. So there's a, David and I often talk about the problem of non-resistant non-belief. And the problem of non-resistant non-belief applies here. You may think that I am a resistant believer. And welcome to whatever view you have. But I read the Bible. And the God that I see there is not a moral savior. He's a moral monster. He is not to be followed. He is to be loathed. But if you think the God of the Bible is all good, that he is actually the perfect loving savior of humanity, then here's my question to Dr. Brown. I am actually a non-resistant non-believer in the sense that that is usually meant. That I want to know true things about the universe and disbelieve as many false things as possible. So in that sense, I am a non-resistant non-believer. And if you think that I have the wrong idea about your God, isn't it your God's job? Doesn't he have an ethical obligation to demonstrate to me in some meaningful, non-ambiguous way that I have the wrong idea of him? And if you say the answer to that question is no, why not? Thank you, Andrew. You guys have hit all the points I wanted to say in my question, so I'm going to take a different angle in my response to this final question. And this is a question for and on behalf of the huge deconstruction community that some of us on this podcast episode have been a part of for a number of years. It's a community that has some really old hats in it. People who have been around the block have been bruised and know how to support people who are new. And it's a community that is getting new people on a regular basis. I'm a member of several Facebook groups, which are specifically for and about new deconstructors. And there are people coming in on a weekly basis into various of these groups who are hurt, who are damaged from the teachings of Christianity. And I know personally young people 
who are not taught Christianity by me before you want to pin any uh, finger, point any fingers at me, who are taught Christianity in churches by people who are Christians now, who have spent time lying in bed at night, worried about are they truly saved and worried, as in fearfully worried, about what that might mean for their physicality and for their spiritual. They have fear. And the God that is being described in this question is not a God that would let his followers experience that. It is a God whose teachings have this side effect, both in young people lying in bed at night and in mature adult people who find themselves lost and hurt and need to find the deconstruction communities that we are all part of for support with questions of, am I losing my mind? Does this person really love me? Why are these people who I love rejecting me? Why do I have this fear in my life? There is so much hurt and baggage that is dragged out of Christianity into the deconstruction community by people who are hurt by the allegedly loving God that Christianity teaches about. Why? because there is something deeply and utterly rotten at the core of Christianity that is directly the cause of all of this. And if Christianity is all about a loving, perfectly merciful Redeemer God, then this simply would not be the case. Thank you, guys. This is your chance for any last thoughts before we close out the show. I'm going to jump in uh, with mine really quick. I promised a minute timing. At the end of the day, all of these questions uh, strike at a certain existential angst in a certain, you know, like a good lawyer trying to find some room for doubt. You know, are you 100% sure? You know, you might be wrong. Are you, do, are you feeling meaningless and purposeless? Can you really say that you're achieving your purpose? You know, all of these things are designed to strike at our uncertainty and our doubt about life in general, uh, our angst, our, our discomfort and discontentment. And the idea is to say, well, so you see that hole that we have discovered in your life, uh, maybe there's an answer. Maybe we need to have further conversations. Let me introduce you to my friend, Jesus. And so I would say that any line of question, well, for any religion, based on exciting your existential angst and fears and doubts should be avoided as a manipulative cult. And the people who do it should be labeled and kicked out of your life in your circle of influence. I just say it's a bit disappointing that um, the conversation hasn't moved on. This is maybe what we expected, you know, 15 years ago from apologists and things. But yeah, I'd have thought there's enough out there for them to now know that they too can see that how weird these questions come across, that they're a little bit baffling, that they've got such a blinkered view on what a non-belief would be. So it's curious that it hasn't really moved on. A bit disappointing, really, I suppose, that maybe on our side as well, we, uh, we should all be moving the conversation on because... You know, not everybody's a fundamental evangelical that we can tear down. <laughs> uh, some people have, you know, got a more nuanced view and they're more progressives and all that kind of stuff. And we have to maybe adapt to our conversation as well. Very surprised that Brown is is that unaware of uh, how people think in this sphere. Yeah, this is about the third, fourth, maybe even fifth set of question shows that Andrew and I've done. And this is not unexpected from the standard of what we've done. And the last question, without fail, seems to have always been this kind of thing. If I could show you God exists, would you worship him? This seems to be the one. Mm -hmm. Christians, different last question, please. We're bored of this one. Please find another one. My five word close. Audience, I beg you, stop confusing belief, and knowledge. I kind of probably echo Sarah with this one. I agree with her. There's absolutely no reason that these kind of questions are still being circulated. There have been so many different questions along this line that have been answered hundreds of years for as long as the atheist philosophers have been writing. So it's not like they can't find the actual answers to these questions without a, you know, just a quick Google search. There's tons of YouTube responses to these kind of questions. And 
they're all the same questions. They never seem to come up with anything new. And I have to wonder if they're so resistant to actually finding out the answers when the answers are so readily available. I have to wonder what exactly is the point? I mean, is it just clickbait so that they can get ad revenue for whatever channel they have? Because it never seems to be genuine curiosity because if it was genuine curiosity, it seems to me like they would go out, Google the answers and add them. And uh, so I have no problems answering their questions, but you know he's just going to be answered, asking the same questions again in another few days. Yep, that's a fair point. Maybe the joke's on us and maybe it's triggering atheists is the only point behind these questions. <laughs> Well, happy to oblige. Well, they don't adapt, do they? Yes. They don't. They don't. They don't adapt. Let's be honest. I mean, William Lay Craig's been put right on quite a few things, and uh, he doesn't adapt his spiel on the Kalam or anything like that. And uh, I think well, Mike Lacona did a little bit when he was quoting Bar Ehrman wrong, and podcast Paul Regia pointed out that he was, you know, attributing things incorrectly to Bar Ehrman to make his point. Uh, and he did make slight changes to his spiel, apparently. So that got picked up. So there's some of them do. I think Mike Lacona is one of the more honest ones, but you know. Even he wasn't beyond maybe misquoting uh, Ehrman to uh, to make his point. So uh, I don't know. They want to stick to their guns on certain things and not update their worldview. The slippery slope if you do. If triggering atheists, if that's the goal, I'm not sure the joke is on us, Matthew, because uh, church parking lots are emptier today than they were a decade before that. They were emptier a decade ago than they were the decade before that. So nuns are now as large as the Catholic Church in the United States, about 23%. Uh, the difference is small enough that it's statistically insignificant. So if you think it's a joke to trigger atheists, um, hey, <laughs> uh, keep, keep that coming. Uh, I think, uh, David, I think you, uh, you say it pretty well. When Christians talk, atheists win. <laughs> <laughs> one has been brought onto my show and false under false pretenses they know my view i'm happy to give you the mic and let you talk for an hour uninterrupted if you want to <laughs> <laughs> excellent well thank you guys it's been a pleasure we should find an excuse to to do this again and dear listeners until next time stand reasonable been listening to a podcast from Reason Press. Do you have any thoughts on what you've just heard? Do you have a topic that you would like us to cover? Please send all feedback to reasonpress at gmail.com. You might even appear on an episode. Our theme music was written for us by Holly. To hear more of her music, see the links in our show notes.